Hey guys, welcome to the LT Brings the Heat podcast. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler, where we talk about baseball and sports performance. With topics ranging from coaching, business, and player development, our goal is to bring you a no BS approach to development in baseball and sports performance. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's rock and roll. Hey guys, uh, welcome to another episode of LT Brings the Heat. Um, we've got a special episode today. Um, Bart Carter, he's a former player at Western Kentucky University. Um, and he's a good buddy of mine. He's going to kind of dive into some things here and kind of give you guys an a, a intro and kind of summary what we're going to talk about. He talks about some things with, with lessons that are not really talked about when it comes to parents, players, like what to expect coming into lessons, what to expect as you're, as you're leaving lessons. Um, and he kind of breaks into detail about long toss too. It's something that I, I love listening. We, we talk all the time about long toss. Um, and then developing a guy's arms. So I'm really excited for people to kind of, the public kind of hear what he has to say here. What's some of the things, Adam, that, that you really enjoyed him talking about? Yeah, first things first, is it's just baseball is such a small world. We both competed against Bart when he played at Western Kentucky when we were at South Alabama. And like I, we came on and I knew you said Bart was coming on and then it was two and two together that, oh, dang, we've actually faced this guy. So the baseball world, everybody knows everybody, man. But mm-hmm. some, he did a great job today breaking down pitching mechanics from long toss program to how to attack as a pitcher. One thing that really stuck out to me was how to handle a situation that's very common of private instructor telling you one thing versus maybe your high school coach telling you another. He does give some great advice on how to handle that, be respectful, and kind of everybody get on the same page where we're all working towards the athlete having success onto the field. What were some other things that stood out to you? Uh, yeah, one thing he, he talked about is, you know, he, he, before we hopped on, he started talking about John Smoltz talking about, you know, all these injuries and everything like that. And um, he talks about if he could do it all over again, how much more serious he would take the weight room and how much more serious he would take the actual training aspect of things and specifically training to be powerful, training to be fast. And I think that's something that's missed on people kind of go through the motions a lot when it comes to the weight room um, and specifically pitchers as well. Um, and that's something I think that is really good, especially from a former player. And Bart was a freshman All-American at Western Kentucky and played pro ball. So any, any pitcher, any baseball player in general, um, this is a good podcast for you guys to listen to. Um, anything else, Adam, before we yeah. uh, wrap the intro up? Yeah, just to keep it simple, is he talks about the best way to learn how to throw a baseball and to be good at throwing a baseball is to throw. And we talk mm-hmm. about it from a hitting standpoint. You want to be a good hitter, you got to hit. If you want to be a good pitcher and an elite pitcher, a healthy pitcher, you have to throw. That's ultimately what you're doing all the time. So I'm tired of the ones that don't want to go toss during the week that they just expect to show up and throw on the weekends. He does a great job of explaining injuries actually come from underuse as opposed to the overuse factor that you hear a lot about with these pitch counts. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, hey, this is going to be a great episode. Um, like always, I always say that, but I, I, there hasn't been an episode that we've recorded that I haven't enjoyed so far. Um, I would definitely tell you if I think we could do better or we would definitely record it again if we could do better. Um, but and if you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave us that five star review. I know we missed an uh, episode last week. Hurricane Sally came in and I was communicating with Adam and Adam and everybody is safe, which is awesome. But we, we uh, got an episode coming this week. It's going to be it's going to be a banger. It's going to be enjoyable. So um, here we go. Hey guys, welcome to another episode. We've got a uh, special guest today, one of my good buddies, uh, Bart Carter. Uh, he's a pitching coach at the NAW Bulls organization. Uh, he's my assistant at the 17 black age level. Uh, played at Western Kentucky as a ball player and then played pro ball for a while. Uh, Bart, how you doing today, man? Doing well. Doing really well. Excited to be on here and share some thoughts and talk shop with you fellas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you know... Um, Kind of before we kind of get started and get into everything, Bart, I'd love to, I love everybody to kind of get to know, you know, you know, the, the guest and kind of get some background on you. Um, you can kind of talk about whatever you want here, but kind of give us your story from high school, you know, through college and then obviously in your pro ball years and kind of where you are today. Yeah. I mean, um, I know what we talk about with our team with Indiana Bulls is kind of the, the, I was almost a, a second teamer for, for my entire life was a late bloomer, if you will. I wasn't the biggest, fastest, strongest. Uh, I always played on the B teams, um, blue collar. So leaving Franklin Community High School and going to Western Kentucky uh, and trying to find my way there for four years. And, you know, we had some battles, uh, you know, Western Kentucky and South Alabama. But um, I definitely had my ups and downs in college. And it felt like towards the end, there were a lot more downs than ups, but uh, just kept plugging, kept grinding. I uh, was lucky enough to get picked up by the Twins in 2010 uh, in the 39th round of, of the first-year player draft. 
found myself in Florida with, uh, you know, a lot of guys I didn't know, um, living in a hotel, pitched pretty well. It, it got me two and a half years, uh, which was two and a half years that I didn't expect I'd have. Um, you know, got to see a lot of the Midwest and, and play a lot of good players and got a lot of cool stories from that. But, you know, in 2012, when I was released, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. So I jumped into coaching, found myself with, with a great group of coaches uh, led by Dave Taylor with the Indiana Bulls. Um, and kind of the rest is history. And then Sean and I picked up a little bit later. I've been doing private instruction since about 2010. Um, definitely some ups and downs with that as well. But yeah, just kind of just an old baseball guy that just can't seem to to leave the game. I mean, that's kind of who I am in a nutshell. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great, man. You know that it's it's built into your blood. You can't get away from it, whether you're playing or whether you're coaching. Bart, did you kind of have an idea? You got a chance to play pro ball, but was there an idea after you got finished that you wanted to get into coaching baseball, whether it was at the travel ball level or private instruction or whatever it was? Yeah, I had dipped my toe in a little bit of private instruction, kind of failed sort of and, and banged my head against a wall and didn't really feel like I was going anywhere with it. Never – never coached a team and when that so no I wasn't really looking for it um but when it was presented it was it was life-changing I mean it was it's the coolest experience to go from one side of of playing and now you have a hand in in developing young athletes to hopefully they you know they reach the same levels as you did um but no I wasn't really looking for it but I'm super happy that that those guys took a chance on me and let me you know come onto their staff and you know, just the summer ball realm is, is the, the realm that I've lived in. So, I, yeah, I mean, it, there, there wasn't a plan of attack, but super glad that, that I am on, on this side of the field now. Absolutely. You know, when you made that transition and when you started getting into lessons, Bart, like what you talk about some of the ups and downs, what were kind of the big downs and kind of the adversities you kind of hit through uh, once you started doing that, whether it's coaching young guys or older guys or kind of, you know, training those guys from all ages? Sure. Uh, the first thing that I had to learn was everybody's different mm -hmm. and nobody's like me, right? Um, when I was in high school, I couldn't hit a ball like Sean Laird. But transitioning into the instructional piece, I thought everybody should throw the baseball just like I do, or I did, you know? And so I was working on same, some of the same sort of things that, that I took from, from pro ball and from college and trying to drive it down the throat of these high school kids who just weren't ready or, or they, you know, or their body didn't move a certain way or I'm doing drills, you know, to, to counteract things the same that I would in the bullpen, um, mm -hmm. you know, for these kids. And, and these were high school level kids, like, like freshman, sophomore, junior kids. When I first started, the younger kids are a completely different animal. I mean, it's, it's a lot of just watching them throw or watching them hit for you guys. It's, it's a lot of just doing, you know, it's not about perfecting the, the movement. It's about getting the movement and then seeing if we can tweak it down the road. Um, so yeah, I ran, I ran into a lot of stuff. I tried to teach from what I had been taught rather than learning, I guess, from, from each athlete that I get in the building uh, or in the cage or in the bullpen, whatever, learning how they move and what would fit best with them. You know, that, and I beat my head against the wall for years and years. And it probably took me, I don't know for you guys, but it was like five years. I felt like I was just treading water mm -hmm. and it was, I had great kids. I had awesome kids and they did everything that I asked them to, but, but I never really, walked out of a lesson being like, man, I really gave that guy everything that he needed. You know, it took a long time to read and watch video and study other guys and methods. And before you really get comfortable, you know, walking out of there on a Sunday or Saturday or whenever you do lessons to say like, man, I put my best foot forward and that kid is better at the end of his lesson than he was at the beginning. And for the first five years, like I, I'll be honest with you, like I really couldn't say that. 
Yeah, that's great stuff. And you hit the nail on the head when everybody's different. I think so many people get caught up into the cookie cutter way that me and Sean talk about all the time, whether it is hitting or working out or throwing, it's, it's all the same. Of Everybody moves different. What I like to ask some coaches is like, was there like that one aha moment where the light bulb kind of went off? Like I figured my niche out with these kids and now I know going forward, this is the plan. I'm going to help them build and attack in this direction. I mean, I wouldn't say there was there was one defining aha moment, but there's been a few. Um, and one in particular that I can look back on was it was probably 15, 16 year old year for the 2017 class. Um, Sean, you had a chance to coach these guys with me. It was the class that I came, I moved up from 14 through 17 with. We had two left-handed pitchers from the same high school and both of them very, very good. Both of them division one pitchers. Um, but they both moved in completely different ways. And it was like, I found myself sitting there in a barn on like a Saturday or Sunday night, our team practice. And they're both doing the same drills. And they were, they were drills that I did just to get myself right. And I saw one of them going like this and I saw the other one going like this. So that was kind of, then it, then it opens the door for conversations. I mean, I never really had like that, Hey, what do you feel sort of conversation? Um, but once I started asking those questions, that was a game changer. Game changer because you get to learn so much. Um, you ask one question and, and you get to learn 10 different answers of different things and how they feel and what their confidence level is. So I wouldn't say a one aha moment, but there's been plenty. Yep. And you know, I love, like, I, I feel like everybody here, obviously, I know you guys both, and we're all humble enough to admit, like, things that we didn't do right and things that, you know, we could have done better and stuff. And, like, I remember when I first started years and years and years ago, and, you know, when I started really trying to build Laird's training, there was two main things. And, and the first one was kind of semantics. Like, you would say load or you would say, you know, separation. And there's different definitions for different guys. And, like, one thing that annoys me when it comes to hitting is people say rotational hitting and linear hitting, which – if you ask 10 different guys, you're going to get 10 different explanations of what each one of those mean. I personally, I, I think hitting is both. I'm not going to get into that right now. It's not the point. Um, but also, like, once we started training um, guys hitters and stuff, so, like, for me, I always say, like, the, the advanced athletes, those guys are really easy to coach, the, as long as they're coachable. Like, you ask them, hey, try this, and then their bodies mentally and physically can do it. Whereas young guys, and this is where a lot of parents get frustrated. It's like, you know, well, Johnny down the street is, you know, throwing 95. Well, and, and my son is doing the same kind of lessons and putting the same amount of work again. Well, there's a difference in athleticism. There's a difference in, you know, you know, the cognitive ability in each athlete um, getting things. Cause you know, that's one thing that's overlooked is not where we're not just trying to train muscle memory, but like you said, asking questions and getting to understand what's going on in between the years. Cause ultimately that's kind of what's most important. Um, but I like I, the same things that you're talking about, like, you know, you, you, you ask a kid to do something like, Hey, let's, let's fire our hips here. Um, and back in the day, I mean, Adam have touched on this, like not knowing that this kid, you know, 10 years ago physically cannot rotate his hip. doesn't matter how much his dad is like, rotate your damn hips. It's not, it's not going to happen. Like he, he my has golf a golf swing. That's my golf swing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and I think that's where a lot of the frustration and, and, and like people don't understand is like, and we say this a million times, but I don't think it's really heard like people don't really hear it is it's, it's a process and a different road for everybody like you might it might take you three years in a row of doing something over and over and over until all of a sudden one day it clicks um and some guys they might in six months they might be a completely different hitter it's just it's just different with everybody because the athleticism is different strength is different and you know the mental toughness and mental fortitude to, to be able to repeat dull mundane things like there's, there's so much that goes into that but I'm, I'm really glad you touched on that for sure yeah, the, ro the rotational versus linear argument is there in pitching as well. Because, I mean, you know as well as I do, you can take a, a pitcher's lower half and a hitter's lower half, and they almost overlay, um, you know, outside of stride length and, and some other things. But they almost overlay. So it's it's not a rotation. Yes, if, if we get big on the front side or whatever, yes, I get it. That's We need to cut that out. But it's not – I'm not going from here – and I'm not throwing a punch at a baseball or I'm not doing this. I'm not throwing a dart as a pitcher. Um, so there needs to be a little bit of both. We need to, mm -hmm. like, like we've talked about, stay in our lane. Don't get big. I mean, all the same 
verbiage used from hitting to pitching, it, it, it works either way. Um, but you're right. Yeah. That argument's always going to be there. Uh, and it's one that I, I fight with a lot um, because I'll get a kid coming over from somebody else. It's like, man, I can't be rotational. It's like, you better. <laughs> I, had, I had a kid the other day that said, I can't hit the ball oppo. I go, what? Why'd you say that? And he goes, well, my coach says I'm a pull hitter. What the hell does that mean? Like, I mean, like, and, and Adam's laughing at this because obviously you, you've, I'm sure you've heard that before too. Is like, just because you're a pull hitter does not mean you don't have the ability to hit to all fields. So you just like, like, yeah. Adam, you probably will say, say I, I pulled the ball probably 70% of the time in college, but my BP was oppo all day exactly. long, oppo yep. all day long. But I mean, that's just differences here and there, but uh, Bart, kind of touch on what you do professionally now, like what you do for a day job, because I think that'll help us transition into kind of the recruiting and kind of the situation we are with COVID-19 and, the, and this kind of crazy year of 2020. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I work for a camp company um, and we put on camps across the country. Uh, it puts college coaches on the same field as, you know, prospective student athletes. So any recruitable athlete in, in high school, um, we do... It, it essentially a showcase camp. Uh, they'll get metrics and things like that uh, after leaving. But the, the real benefit of, of doing what we do is, is putting kids in front of college coaches of, of a, how do, how do you say it? Of a realistic, you know, sort of expectation. So in COVID, this, this whole thing was the D1 dead period and things like that is, is a struggle because a, a lot of guys want to get that experience of being on the field with division one schools. And, and it's just not possible this year. Uh, mm -hmm. The NCAA has said that, you know, D one schools have to stay home, do their recruiting from, from their cell phones or from their couches, but they have to remain out of it. Um, so yeah, in the COVID period, there, there are some places, obviously, you know, there's spikes in certain areas of the country and there's, there's lulls in other other areas of the country that are that are a little bit more lenient to hold these camps, but you know, kids really want to get out and play baseball, and and to take it to another level, they they still want to continue that recruiting process, um, which has been a struggle because a lot of schools can't get out to see these kids play, and you know, on a limited schedule, obviously is you know not everybody is getting out to play, and your your schedule over the summer shrunk so. Kids are looking for other opportunities to to make themselves, you know, a recruitable asset to some of these programs. But yeah, the COVID is uh, is definitely it's tough. But I, I will say that if if you are a kid that wants to play at the next level, you hear it from your parents all the time. It's like take the initiative, right? Like you you have to if if you want to get better, you got to wake up earlier. You got to work out earlier. You got to all these different things, get your schoolwork done so that you can spend time in the cage. All those things you've heard your parents say a million times is, is on another level. Now it's everything. If you want to go to college and play in college, you can't sit back and hope that you're four for four with four singles. The other day plays on a recruiting video, mm -hmm. you know, you got to get on, get on your computer, get on your phone, reach out to some of these schools that you want to play for and just drop them a dime. You don't have to write them a book, but drop them a dime and be like, Hey, I got a lot of interest. You know, if, if you know, here's, here's how you can see my recruiting video or my highlight tape or, or what have you give them a little bit of stats and then just leave it at that. But have yourself a list of schools that are very realistic. Obviously everybody wants to play at LSU. Obviously, everybody wants to play at South Alabama. You're welcome. But, <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's not the, the case for everybody. And like you talked about earlier, everybody's got a different path. Mm -hmm. Some guys, you know, like, like the Sean Lairds of the world in high school, you were on the interstate. Mm -hmm. You know, other guys like, like me were on, were on the back roads trying to get to where. But it, <laughs> and it's different. It's different. And it's not to say one way is right or one way is wrong. Yep. But kids need to take a lot more initiative today um, just because of the, the climate that we're living in um, and drop dimes to coaches and, and work with people that are close to you and get a realistic list of schools that, that you know, obviously, like if we're not going to school just to play baseball, so match it up with your academics. You know, what do you want to do following baseball? Because I can tell you that baseball is not, not forever. 
you know, one of these days, somebody's going to take the spikes off your feet uh, and that'll be it. So, and then you need to, to have that academics to fall back on um, when that does happen. Yeah. You made some really good points in that because there's, this is something, and I'm not going to use any names here, but obviously we've had a million conversations over the years. We could probably talk about this stuff for hours, but I had a parent uh, one time basically ask me, um, how are you going to get my son recruited? And, and especially with the bulls, like, obviously, you know, that's kind of a backhanded question, but at the same time, I guess you can look at it as like, Hey, you're the Indiana bulls. Like you guys are getting everybody college scholarships or whatever. But I think one thing I want to clear after touching on what you said about players taking initiative is we don't get kids scholarships. The kids get themselves recruited. And it's one, you have to have ability, obviously, right. You have to be able to play at that next level. But two, um, we're just kind of a guide. We can help have these conversations with coaches. We can do these things. Uh, but like you said, especially right now, you have to take the initiative. These schools, you know, like especially for the next two years of college, these guys, you know, the 21s and the 22s, it's going to be really hard for them, obviously, competing. Um, and so you've got to stand out and, you know, let's communicate with colleges. It's, it's, it's taking initiative saying, hey, coach, these are the five colleges I'm interested in. Are these realistic for me? Is it from what you've seen? And that's one thing I think coaches can do a better job of accountability wise is like, Hey, let's make sure that these kids are on the same page. And especially the parents too, because sometimes the kids are on the same page, but then there's parents, like you said, well, my son wants to play at LSU. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody's Me different. Too. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, I mean, it's, it's a process and people understand is like, you know, the responsibility, the responsibility ultimately comes down to you and you have to put in the work one, but you also have to take the initiative and have those communication especially nowadays when a lot of kids have trouble with communicating and expect people to do things for themselves. Yeah. Well, just think about it too. Like baseball is such a unique sport that, that, you know, physically I do not match up to you mm -hmm. physically. If we were going to go one-on-one, -on -one, you push me over 10 times out of 10, but baseball is not built like football. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have that mentality of like, man, it's, it's, it's LSU or bust. Yep. Like, well, you know, what about those other schools that are going to play LSU and beat LSU or, you know, it doesn't have to be just LSU, but you know, they're going to beat them on a midweek mm -hmm. or they're going to get an opportunity to play them early in the season on a weekend. And, and a lot of times, you know, there's great talent at the mid major level where football is a little bit different than that, where it's just a size deal. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, baseball is blessed in the sense that it's deep in talent. It's such a skill sport. It's, I mean, yeah. you could have a guy that, that, that could run a mile in 10 minutes and, and absolutely deal on the bump. Yeah. Um, there's so many, I mean, it's just a skill specific sport. Adam, is yeah. there anything else you want to touch on with that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is just understanding, like, if you can play baseball and you're trying to have play at the pro level, is there's so many different avenues. They'll find you. They'll find you at a D3. I mean, I don't know the stat that they put up, not this past draft, but the one before that there was more D2, D3 guys drafted versus the D1 guys when they combined them all together. And it was just so cool to see the different avenues to try to ultimately get there if that's your ultimate goal is to play professional baseball. Bart, I want you to hit on something where, uh, especially in the recruiting age now of so much social media, video, you're having to contact these coaches via text message or video message, Twitter, whatever it is you're using. What would you recommend to players and parents on what to maybe send a college coach or maybe what to send your recruiting services, like a highlight tape? What do they really need to attack on to get people's attention? Yeah, I think just keeping it short and sweet is the best thing. Um, you know, you talk to college coaches and they, they don't have a lot of time on their hands to begin with. Um, yes, they like guys reaching out to them, but – if you send them an email and it's six pages long and here, here's what I did at this tournament, this tournament, this tournament, they, that's wash. Yep. You know, send them, Hey, I, I got a lot of interest. Um, I followed your program. I know about your program. I want to go to school here because of list a few reasons, none of them being baseball. Like I already know you have a good baseball program. You know, I want to go be an engineer or, or what have you, whatever it is, list that. This is why I'm reaching out to you. Mm -hmm. here's my highlight tape. Yeah. If you got a highlight tape, that's a bonus. Um, because if they haven't laid eyes on you and you know, they want to see how the swing works or how the arm works or, or whatever, but I would say, yeah, compile everything that you can and recruiting services are great. If you have the, the financial means to pull that off. Um, cause some of them do get a little pricey, but yeah, they're great to, to open up doors. But I think, as condensed as possible when you're reaching out to college coaches is best. I don't think it needs to be also, you know, 
here's everything that I do well and I do nothing bad. I think maybe you can address that. Like, hey, I ran a 7.6. Probably need to improve that. I'm working on it, right? Yeah, I, condense it as much as possible. But yes, I think if you got a highlight tape, if, you got, if you've got metrics to give them, that's a good starting point. Absolutely. And that's one thing I was going to, I was going to say, and you, you just said it right there at the end is make sure you give some metrics and, and we got to be realistic here. And, and we had uh, Jeff Mercer, head coach at IU on uh, in, a, in a private kind of to our own clients podcast. And obviously he's one of your best friends, um, you know, and, and he was talking about, we were talking about launch angle and stuff like that. And he's like, Hey, you know, hit the ball 90 mile an hour plus good things are going to happen. And that's, you know, it's you got to be realistic. If you're saying, if you're sending a video to IU or LSU or these big schools and you're hitting 75 to 80 mile an hour exit velo, you got to be more realistic with yourself. And that's something that you can understand. It's very easy to find out what the average, you know, metrics are for certain guys, obviously 90 plus mile an hour arms, is what you want to see on the bump, hitting the ball 90 plus mile an hour consistently. You know, those are things that people need to understand is like, those are the metrics you need to be. You can't just say, Hey, this guy's a hard worker. And, <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, he's got a high upside. <laughs> well, all those are great things, yeah. but mm -hmm. I wouldn't lead with them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's yeah. one of those things that people, I think, and no offense to the people that are like that. There's a lot of hardworking kids and, and they do a great job. And there's definitely got, we talk about those, some of those guys might turn into the 90 plus hour guys. It just, you just got to understand when you reach out to those schools, be realistic in the situation. You know, if you get, you know, a 700 or SATs, you're not going to apply to Harvard. You know, if you, you want to correlate the, the education side of things and use and that. Be analysis. honest about the metrics too. Be honest about no. the metrics. Don't. Oh, lie. Yeah. oh yeah. And as you know, because like at some I'm, point, at some point, somebody's going to ask you to run that 60. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I've had, I've had guys that, that, that want an alternative tryout for the bulls are like, I throw from the left side, 87 miles an hour. And so we'll set up something and, and it's 80 mile an hour on, you know, and that's his top, but he's sitting 75, 77. So, right. you know, being honest with yourself is a big deal. And talking about metrics and kind of, you know, the development side, I guess we're talking about that right now. You know, Bart, this is something we talk about all the time. And there's a lot of misconceptions on it. You know, when it comes to long toss, you know, and I think you do a really good job of breaking this down. And, and there's a lot of people think that throwing long toss, you have to throw as hard as you possibly can. And we had Zach Thompson on a few weeks ago. Um, and we didn't have a podcast last week because of the uh, uh, Hurricane Sally coming down and, and, and all the stuff that went down there. And thank God Adam was safe and everybody was from there. But when it comes to long toss, how, how can you best describe this so people would understand like, hey, you're not throwing a ball 100 mile an hour or 100% all the time. You're building your arm up. You're training your arm. We're trying to build our arm up to be able to play day to day. Can you kind of break that down long toss for us right now? Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and, and I'll start with saying – you know, Zach Thompson is an ex exceptional pitcher, exceptional. Mm -hmm. He's one of the freaks of the world um, that's able to do different things, and he's found his niche. He's found his, his deal. Mm -hmm. um, but when I talk about long toss, I don't necessarily – I wouldn't necessarily talk about a specific number of feet that you need to go. When I think about long toss, I think about volume, mm -hmm. right? So Zach – can tell you that he doesn't long toss and that is perfectly fine. But I can tell you that his volumes and his workload are going to match his expected workload on game day. Um, you know, because you have to train for game day, right? So long toss for me, and I didn't figure this out until I got to pro ball, but it, it is so undervalued um, because it allows you to not only strengthen your arm, but stretch your arm. You know, and if you're, con if you're in a constant state of throwing darts, right, at 60 feet, 90 feet, whatever it is, you don't allow those muscles to, to stretch, to work like they would whenever you walk out on the game mound. Um, but when I look at long toss, I think, like you need your, like we talked about in strength and conditioning, it's, it's heavy, medium, light days, right? So your biggest day of the week is obviously the day you pitch, Um and there's no getting around that. We're going to expect you as, as coaches to take on a big workload. Um, and until you give up five jacks to South Alabama um, by the fifth <laughs> inning, then you get bounced. But, um, but coaches are going to expect you to, if you're a starter, take the ball and run with it as long as you can. Um, but long toss to me is, man, I have to do this at least six days a week. And you train your body – 
to work at a level that that is is similar to what would be on the mound. And I don't think long toss, and like you touched on, I don't think long toss needs to be 100% max effort. When I talk about heavy day, medium day, and light day, medium day and light day, like we never get to 100% ever. Um, if you feel, you know, if you feel you got the Jones to, to pull one down on the way in, that's fine. But your medium and light days are not going to be, I mean, you may get to 75%, maybe. And, you know, you get out to a respectable distance that doesn't necessarily have to be the same distance as, as Johnny next to you. But you get out to a distance that you and your partner feel comfortable with, produce a little bit of sweat, um, and then work it in from there. But your your heavy days are going to be your bullpen days. They're going to be your, you know, your game day on the mound sort of stuff. But that's when we stretch it out and add a little bit more time. I think time – you know, to increase the volume, increases the strength of the arm, the flexion of the arm, all that stuff. And then you work down to your to your mid days and to your light days. And the mid and light days are also going to be coupled with a lift, um, hopefully. You know, if you got a kid that's on the right program. But uh, I think I think just throwing in general. I love long toss so much, and there's there's a guy in Southern Indiana that does it better than than most. Um, and he started Long Toss Indiana a long time ago. And you see some of those kids that came out of that program, and we've seen them on our team. They come through, and all they want to do is throw. Well, none of those kids have arm issues as they get older. You know, like serious arm issues. Like, there's mm-hmm. the one offs. But, but it's like, man, I want to get out here. I want to throw. I want to do this. Nine times out of ten, you get a high school kid that's like, yeah, it's 90 feet today. Like, I'm supposed to throw tomorrow. It'll be 90 feet. Yeah. You got to, it's no difference in the weight room. Like if you want to squat 500, you better start squatting. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, if you want to throw into the seventh, into the ninth, like you better start throwing. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where, yes, a lot of people look at long toss and they're like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to go out to 400 feet and let it eat for 15 minutes. And then you expect me to do that tomorrow too. Like, it's not about that. It's about stretching the arm, getting that release point, getting the feel, um, you know, and then you reach a certain point where you just know that release point, you know, you don't have to watch it. And I think a lot of kids nowadays, and I'm going to spin this a little bit different way is kids can't play catch Mm -hmm. and kids can't play catch past 60 feet and kids can't play catch under a hundred percent. And you and I both know that, some of your pitches in the game aren't a hundred percent. You know, some of them are, I got to take two to three off of them fastball, right? Mm-hmm. They can't do that. They pitch it, call it 85, 86 all game. Well, that hitter knows 85, 86. They got that timed up. Mm-hmm. You know, what happens when you need to sink it or whatever? You don't have that feel. So I think not only the health of the kids uh, and the health of the kids as they get older, but, you know, just creating some of that muscle memory. I think long toss plays a huge role. Um, you know, and it's kind of something we touched on getting into this was kids just flat don't throw enough. Yep. And, and coaches put this, hey, you're going to throw Friday, you're going to throw Saturday or whatever, and you're just going to go. Like I'm yep. going to – like pitch count, yeah, well, whatever. But then I don't expect you to do anything for the rest of the week. And a lot of these kids, you know, they take the rest of the week off and then – pretty soon it's Saturday again. Yep. And it, it's like, well, I didn't want to throw because I was sore. That doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. You know, if the more you throw, the less sore you're going to be moving forward. So do your pre-work, uh, you know, so the game is a little bit, a little bit easier, but. Yeah. I, I use the analogy all the time is like in the weight room, like I don't stop lifting because I'm sore, right? I'm not going to stop throwing because I'm sore. You've got to, most kids, and we agree with this hundred percent and our philosophies are pretty similar a lot. Um, and they're under trained and you, your training output has got to match, uh, got to match your, your game output. And, and, and that's the one thing, like we see this all the time in the summers, guys on the, don't do anything on Mondays and Tuesdays or Wednesdays. If we don't have games on Wednesdays and they expect to be good by the end of the summer. And it's very easy to see, like you see the guys at the end of the summer that are still getting, they're still throwing the same they were, or they're stronger and other guys, they're down four, five, six, seven mile an hour. And, and sometimes they're down because they're being overthrown and we won't even get into guys throwing. I, I had a kid um, that was being thrown four times a weekend. Um, and so I kind of told his dad, I was like, this is, this is absolutely stupid. Don't let that happen again. 
Um, but that's neither here nor there. It's just, but guys got to understand is like, you have to train your body in order to keep yourself healthy. Like your arms got to be able to withstand the stress of throwing on the bump. If you're not throwing on these other days. And like for us, we do two heavy days, two medium days and two light days. Sure. And then we have one day off. Um, that, well, we program one day off and I know everybody's different. Like, you know, we coached Max Hallbegger, a pitcher at, at Lipscomb. That dude could throw every single day. He could probably start on, on a game every single day because of how much he threw and was yeah. comfortable with that. But I'm on the same page with that hundred percent under trained guys. It, it, it's, it's running rampant nowadays. And it's, and it's a constant cycle too. It's all they do. So call it an eight seat or eight week summer season week over week over week, these guys get more and more and more sore, you know, and then they end up taking more and more time because they feel like they need it mm -hmm. because the work wasn't put in on the front end. Um, so then you get those guys that lose, you know, five to 10, whatever, over the course of the summer. And they're like, I don't know what's happening. I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> eating my Wheaties. Right. But it, yeah, you got to put in the work on the front end to be able to maximize your workload uh, in the game. And yeah, it's super important. And I think, you know, parents and players alike, uh, you know, kind of overlook it in the sense that, ah, that's, that's too much workload on me. Um, you know, I got, I got to be ready. I got to be a hundred percent come Saturday or, or whenever you pitch, but it's, uh, it's the front end work that I think's missed a lot. And, and I think it could, you know, we're in a, we're in a pandemic, not with COVID, but we're in a, we're in a pandemic with TJ and arm issues and it keeps getting younger and younger. And it's because we're asking these kids to take on workloads that, that they're just not ready for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, everything you just covered there, Bart, was excellent points. And the main thing I took away is if you want to be better at throwing, you have to throw. And we talk about it all the time with hitters is all these drills and gimmicks and stuff out there. Ultimately, you have to hit if you want to become a better hitter. So I'm so That's glad true. that you just made it simple there is if you want to be better at throwing the baseball, you have to get out there and throw the baseball five to six days a week. It's just the way it's got to be. And I remember talking to – it was a Latin player when I was playing in the minors, and I would mentioned to him, I said, look, number one, I know every Latin I've ever played with has an absolute cannon. And I said, number yep. two, I notice you guys don't get hurt as much as the American players or American kids – I asked him basically through a translator, like, what did he think the difference was? And he mentioned how much they throw in Latin America when they're back home. Whereas the ones here, if they have the pitch count, well, I only threw 60 pitches on the weekend. All right, well, what'd you do the rest of the week? Oh, I didn't do anything. I was sore from the weekend, so I took my day off, and then I did this, <laughs> and then I had basketball, and, that, and they just didn't throw enough. And so yeah. I talked to, I was actually talking to a parent last night about it. Is if you just look back at the injuries of whether it's Tommy John related or anything shoulder related, there's so many more Americans geared that way versus Latin Americans, and I believe physically it's because they're throwing six days a week. The guys that. I had played with as well. We're long tossing every single day to get out there and they know their body. And I'm so glad that you covered. There's not one way to do this whole thing is you have your heavy days, your medium days, your light days. I never heard anybody put it like that, but it makes so much sense. And just knowing your body and knowing yourself. Cause I think as coaches, they're always looking to us for answers, which are important, but at the same time, we don't know your body like you do. And so you could be absolutely gassed and Hey, let's do it in this direction. And it goes back again to the athlete, just be honest with the coach. If you're having some issues or there was a kid that came in and threw yesterday that he threw about 20, 25 pitches and he was complaining about his arm being sore and we asked him what he had been doing. And sure enough, he threw over the weekend. Well, when's the last time he threw before then? Well, it has been a couple of weeks before I, since I was off the, the mound last. And so it's now don't be getting abused by getting picked up by these different teams to showcase yourself if you're not physically ready to do that. So that kind of leads me into my next question now. We're, I would say we're in – the quote unquote off season right now. So what would you put a game plan together with maybe for some high school guys is what are the things they really need to, their building blocks of focusing on velocity gains, or maybe it's a new pitch they're trying to come up with. What would you kind of put it into show? Yeah. Um, awesome point. Before I get to that awesome point with the, the Latin kids. I mean, when I was playing, it was the Venezuelan kids were all they did was throw. And I remember asking the same question, like, yo, you just, you just threw two innings and now we're shagging BP and you're throwing a flatty to somebody. It's like, you, how, how'd you do this? Well, it's all they do is throw, but you work up to that level. Absolutely. Um, in the off season, I just put together a plan for, for one of my kids that I've had for a long time, football players. So it's a little bit tougher. And Sean and I, we, we go back and forth on this. Um, get in the weight room as much as you can. Um, 
get bigger, faster, stronger, you know, work on those explosive movements. If you, if you're a guy that this year is weird because it's like we were off, you know, from April to July or, or whatever the time frame was. So it's kind of backwards, right? So that, that off period for kids is going to be a little bit different um, where you won't get most kids that take off on a normal calendar year. You get kids that take off like what, September, end of August, September, and then they'll take off through like November and just give mm-hmm. themselves that period where this year may be a little bit different, where we may be able to utilize a little bit more of the off season because we had the, you know, quote unquote dead period um, where we just didn't have anything, but get in the weight room, get as explosive as you can and take it serious. Uh, If I could do it again, that would be the first place that I started. Um, You know, because I I didn't learn to be explosive ever, but I should have. Um, you know, whenever it came to quick twitch and sprint work and stuff like that, I was always okay. And I was okay with being okay, which is a huge problem because if, if I didn't have a really good breaking ball, then we probably wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation right now. Um, Mm -hmm. but take it serious, take box jumps, take sled pulls, take deadlifts, take whatever it is you're doing in the awesome med ball throws, take it serious and, and put together each rep over rep. Like it's, you know, give yourself that break and make sure it's max effort whenever you step in there to do that rep. Uh, Because if you don't, then you're just training slow switch muscles and you just, you're kind of strong for nothing. Right. Um, Which is what you're supposed to be at the end of your career. Like you get in the weight room, you can be as slow twitch as you want, but during your career, you know, take it serious and move as fast as you can. Uh, and then with the long toss stuff or developing a new pitch, um, I know a lot of kids, a lot of kids in high school, they'll ask me, they'll say, you know, I need another breaking ball or I need a whatever. If, if your breaking ball now is not a plus, you probably don't need to add another one just yet. Um, and I don't say that to just like, shy kids away from throwing sliders because I think sliders, the best, one of the best pitches in baseball, Mm -hmm. but it's like, if we can't get our hand over the top, why are we dropping to get on the side of it? Mm -hmm. Um, Just to get a big sweeping curveball. So I think have a plan of attack, build your pitches in your mind. um, You know, the shape of your pitches and then ultimately just spin it until it feels comfortable. And I wouldn't, um, and I'm going to touch on this in a second, Sean, my favorite drill, but I wouldn't take learning a new pitch to the mound until I've absolutely mastered it at about 60% in a flatty. Um, you know, but my biggest thing in the off season is whenever we're developing a new pitch or whenever we're trying to tweak a pitch that we already have, we're going to use a softball. And the reason that I use a softball is because it over exaggerates, you know, those fingers over the top of the ball, mm-hmm. right? Or if we're throwing a change up, it over exaggerates. Like you have so much more room you have to cover to get over the top of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think first and foremost, before before the pitch, pitch development and things, yeah, they can go hand in hand, but get in the weight room and get as quick as you can. Make sure your hips are mobile. You know, make sure make sure your body is as stretched as it can be, and take it serious. Because I think I think a lot of kids they they hinder themselves because yeah they'll go to the weight room, but they're not doing anything following the weight room for mobility and and flexibility and things like that. So that, I think that's first and foremost. Um, but then pitch development is is obviously something that you know every pitcher we we need to spend time on. But I think that's a lot more geared towards once you know, the first of the year, once we start turning it back on. Absolutely. You know, uh, we kind of talked about this on the phone a few weeks ago, and I kind of want you to, I kind of want you to bring this up. Um, So we talk about pitching lessons and we talk about young guys pitching lessons versus older guy pitching lessons. And we're talking about off season training. Um, So what are the, some big mistakes that you see with guys, you know, whether it's a parent wanting to get somebody with pitching lessons or it's, it's a kid that's wanting pitching lessons that focus overly too much on mechanics versus the actual development side? What are some of the big mistakes 
Um, and you can kind of repeat the whole conversation that we had. You can say whatever you want here on that. Cause I have an idea what you're going to say. And it's, it's going to be good for people to hear. So I do lessons. So let me preface that. I do give pitching lessons and we do talk about mechanics. One of the issues and one of the things that always comes up and I th we started to touch on it a little bit earlier, but it's the, it's the fast food mentality. Like I'm paying for this. I expect like for you guys being hitting guys, like I, I just gave you X amount of money and I, I should be driving Mike Trout home. Uh, <laughs> that. It's no different, but it, it's always the struggle. It's trust the process, but in the same breath as trust the process, trust the person that you put your, your kid with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of questions need to be asked um, because you are being hired as, as a, as an instructor. And I think a lot of us instructors think, you know, we're, we're just instructors. Like if you don't want to come to like, I don't have to interview or answer any of your questions. Like, and I know that's not the case for everybody, but, I've been there where it's like, you know, you want to ask me a question, like it's whatever. But if you get, if you start having those conversations with parents, you get a lot more realistic parents where they come in and it's like, look, this is going to be a grind. Like we are so far behind or, or whatever. And we got a lot of ground to make up and we have this, this, and this to cover, you know, for those parents to come in and ask those questions of, of the instructor early mm -hmm. um, is huge because there's a million instructors out there and, and there's a million instructors that are phenomenal, phenomenal. But then there's a lot of instructors that chase the dollar, um, you know, and, and don't just hang your hat on, you know, a playing career. Um, there's a lot of really good ex players. I think us, we would be in that boat. Um, don't ask me that 10 years ago because that's not the same answer I'd give you. But um, a, lot of, a lot of good ex-players are now instructing. There's a lot of bad ones too. Yep. So make sure you do your due diligence as a parent um, to, to ask those questions. Say like realistically, like where do you see my kid? Well, I see your kid playing JV or I see your kid, you know, playing second or, or on a varsity level or whatever have those conversations and those realistic uh, goals, I guess, outlined prior to, but yeah, the fact of, of going to lessons just to change mechanics is not going to change your game. Um, mm -hmm. So younger kids, a lot of times whenever I get them in, all we do is throw, you know, like we'll, we'll touch on some drill stuff and some how we kind of want your body to move. And then we immediately move out of that to a throwing setting so they can try and implement what we just worked on. We're then going to go out of that throwing setting back and see if we can get back to the same spot. So then you develop that feel. Older guys, if you got, if you got a project on your hands, yeah, then you got you to tear it down and remold. But if you got a guy that's got some good stuff going, um, like I know you guys have a ton of them, you got good things going, don't, you know, don't try and change it. Right. You're not trying to invent the wheel. So older guys, maybe they need a, maybe they need a tweak. Maybe they need, you know, they need hand separation timing or they need, you know, whatever it is, uh, stride direction, you know, some things like that extension, hand extension, you work on those things and then you let them throw so that they can feel those things. I think a lot of times guys are like, you know what, I'm going to sign up for lessons. I'm going to send my kid to lessons and I want to see like 10 drills done. And then I want to go home. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, little Johnny's not going home and doing a crack the egg drill in his living room. Right. When little Johnny wants to play baseball, like he's going to throw a baseball. He's not going to be like, well, hang on. I got to do my, my crack the egg or, or whatever. Let them be athletes. And I think a lot of times we get, we get parents that bring kids to lessons or they want to bring kids to lessons. They're just not ready. You know, they throw against a wall, throw against a, a screen, like throw with your dad, throw with your buddies, like throw as much as possible. Or for you guys, it would be hit. It's hit as much as you can and then start to develop that feel on your own because that self feel is so important. Um, and it's missed if you over lessen a kid, you know, because if you over lessen a kid and give them a million drills, 
the bottom of the seventh inning, you put him in the game and it's like, it's a robot situation. And we don't know how to correct mistakes. Um, so yeah, was that kind of where yeah, you were leaning? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head there of, of setting, ex, you know, expectations in reality. And what kind of what I do is the, my athletes in the parent, well, obviously the parents, they'll fill out a waiver and I have a part of the areas like areas to improve goals, aspirations, blah, 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 blah. So when they show up for the first day, I know exactly what they want. I know exactly what their goals are. And, and, um, I'm lucky enough that we've built a brand and people know what to expect. They show up. It's a hardcore, it's a blue collar environment. They know kids are going to get better because of the track record of the kids. But what I love to do is I love, what do you think the biggest strengths are and biggest weaknesses are in your kid? And then I ask the kid the same thing. I want the kid to be able to give me an answer. Yeah. And if, if most of the time it's not the same and sometimes the kid's looking at the dad or looking at the mom and they don't know how to respond, that tells me a ton right there that, you know, the, the, the parents kind of dominating the personality, which is not, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just the kids need to be able to stand on their own two feet and communicate because what the kid feels versus what the parent sees is completely different a lot of times. And sure. after we have that initial conversation, you know, and we're always trying to improve metrics, you know, m- you know, movement patterns, all that stuff. And then from there, once we have that conversation, I really don't ever hear from the parents unless like you said, they ask questions about, um, Hey, you know, what, what should I expect here? You know, is he, you know, JV talent, is he varsity talent? You know, um, Hey, what should I do in this situation with this summer ball team and stuff like that? And I love answering those questions with parents. Um, cause I want to help them out obviously. And I'm, I'm wanting to develop the kids, but you hit the nail on the head there. And, and the fact that, you know, you have to have, you can't just work toward nothing. You have to have an idea what they want to get out of it. And at the same time, you have to tell them what your program is about and what your, what your, your goals are when kids come to see you. No doubt. I think, I think one of the biggest things you said there is too, when parents ask you questions, I mm-hmm. absolutely, when I first started this, I didn't want anybody asking me questions because I felt, because I was so insecure and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Mm-hmm. I didn't want them to ask me questions because, you know, I felt like that was, I had to justify myself, right? Any more? Like, yeah, if, if dad or mom want to come watch, like, here's your spot to sit and watch. Don't interrupt us. Like we're working, but please ask as much as you can. I mean, I want to be able to tell this parent because that's, that's also a comfort level. You know, if the parent feels comfortable enough to ask me, I know that Johnny feels comfortable enough to ask me. Mm -hmm. And I want to have that, that back and forth. I want to be able to have those conversations because inevitably like they are entrusting me with their son Mm -hmm. and the development of their son. So that's funny that, that you brought that up of the, of the questions is I look back and it's like, I didn't want to answer any questions, but now it's like, I welcome them so much because now the parents on board with what the kid's doing developmental wise, mm-hmm. um, you know, and they're all kind of locked into the same idea uh, of growth, but yeah, it's most of my parents, 99% of parents that I've, I've given lessons to their kids we'll, we'll stand 15 feet away. And then right when the, uh, the lesson's over, we have a conversation, Mm -hmm. good, bad, or indifferent, whatever it is. Um, but we're going to have a conversation and we're going to buffer that like five minutes to say like, Hey, we worked on this. This was good. This was needs improvement, whatever. I think that's a huge part in doing what we do is, is making sure that the parents are, because if you leave the parents out in the dark, you know, then, then you get, you, you get the ghost, you get, you get the kids that don't show up anymore just for no reason. You just don't know where they went. Um, and then you also get the kid that that's will jump ship on you real quick. So um, I think having that piece of it's pretty big. Yeah. And to be yeah, clear, for the, yeah, go ahead, Adam. Communication. It's, it's the number one thing that lacks in this world and all parts of the world is just being able to communicate with people. And I think, like you mentioned, I used to be the same way where parents asked me questions about it. I would kind of take offense to it. Like, why do I have to answer your question? But then yeah. the more I start to realize is they're with their athlete a whole lot more than we are. So the more we can help them understand what their athlete needs to do, the better they're going to be doing this stuff on their own at the house. Because if they're coming in once or twice a week, we're only seeing them for a limited amount of time. Where if you just tell them, hey, this is what they need to do when they go out on their own and when you're taking them there. And the best is dads will come up to me and they'll – 
tell me exactly what they're doing with their hitter. And Adam, I don't say anything, but I just sit there and go through everything that y'all guys go through. And it's funny. <laughs> I think, yeah, look, I don't want to say anything wrong, so I won't do it, but I'm going to run them through the exact same stuff. So I'm so glad that you hit on that. So we talk about it all the time with me and Sean. It's just like parents, ask the questions, ask the right questions but ask questions and learn kids ask questions because so many kids will leave the lessons that they're going to and have they'll forget it as soon as they walk out the door what they just worked on that day so a question i like to ask the the athlete here is when they come back in i already know the answer but i'm going to ask them like hey what was it we really worked on last week and they better be able to respond back to me what it was otherwise they're just wasting their time and kicking rocks of trying to get a little bit better and you have to start all over again and then it's getting build that block back up where it's hey when they come in right away they know what warm-ups they've got to do that way when they hop in the cage it's go time and we're ready to get after it so i'm glad that you covered that for parents that are listening ask questions and if that instructor doesn't want to answer your questions maybe start looking for somebody else to go to because you have to be able to communicate with your instructor or with your coach yeah. And you know, one thing that it's, and to be clear, we obviously don't want psychos trying to come in the cage and, and asking questions every five seconds, a hundred percent. But like it, to kind of give people that are listening an idea, like the younger age groups, you know, those eight to 12 to 13, 14 year old age groups, you know, it's important if you want the kids to develop in your program that they're doing these drills on their own. So it's, who are they hitting with most when they're not with you? It's usually the dad, right. Or the mom, you know, softball players, stuff like that. Like they have to have a basic understanding of what you're trying to achieve in order to do that. And then obviously as they get older and Adam, you, 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 you were money right there. It's like, they've got to be able to repeat what you did last week. And like the older kids, like you never really hear from the parents much from the older kids because at that point in time, it's like teaching them how to be a man. You know, they, you got to be accountable to what you're doing. What did we work on last week? What are we trying to do here? Hey, did you do this drill? Right. Cause every, I mean, you guys both, you and I both know, that, you know, just because you give them homework and stuff they need to be doing doesn't mean that they're doing it right. And doesn't mean that the dad is like, so this is the drill this dad watched, right? And they're going to do this drill. They could be doing it completely wrong. So having an understanding of what your objective is with a drill or your objective is with what they should be working on, that's a big deal. And, and it's, it's, it's something that always has to be communicated with. Um, and like most of the time, like you can, you can hear watching outside the cage and guys will understand, Hey, what, what, what's he trying to do? But sometimes just what we talked about earlier, semantics, if I say, Hey, we're doing this separation here, just based on their preconceived notion or history in the past, they might be thinking something completely different. So it's good to have those conversations. Um, and we're kind of wrap those things up at the end. But I think, I think too, by having a dad or a mom ask those questions, even if, even if they take, you know, I said crack the egg drill earlier, even if they take it, and they do it completely wrong, at least they're invested and they're doing it. You know what I mean? Rather than, I would rather have that of, you know, that parent being like, hey, I'm going to try this this week. We're going to try this a couple times. And then they they try it, albeit, yeah, maybe not how we wanted it, but they're doing it. The people that don't ask questions, they don't take that, that initiative are not going to do anything through the week. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I like, I like when those those parents and those players, they're like, Hey, give me a couple things that I need to work on through the week. Uh, and don't kill them. You know, don't, don't shoot a dead horse. If, if you, if you can't get the change up, you know, to spin right out of your hand or the breaking ball, like it's spinning sideways. We want it over the top. You know, don't, don't think you have to sit out there and throw a whole bucket of balls to achieve it. But you know, those parents that bring that stuff to you and, and say like, Hey, give me some bullet points of what I need to look for. I love that because I know that those people, when they ask me that they're going to try and implement them that week, um, which sets that kid apart, you know, throw talent out the window that sets the kid apart on just a, you know, just a workhorse level. Like it, that parent is, or, or even the kid that just takes the initiative on their own um, is going to separate themselves just by putting in that work or, or trying. And even if they, they can't get the drill right, they're going to learn more about their body in that bad drill than they would have playing Xbox. Yep. That makes so much sense. One last question I want to ask Bart from a standpoint is I think a lot of days there's so many of the private instructors out there. And I, there's a QB country is right down the road. He trains all the quarterbacks here in town. And we have conversations about how to deal with maybe – 
high school coach versus private instructor. Would you kind of have any advice on how to handle that from a pitching perspective of maybe my pitching coach that I go to privately have been working with for three to four years, has a plan for me, and my high school coach is trying to make me do something just because it's his way. What would you kind of recommend to kind of for the parents and for the athletes to how, to how to handle that situation? I think it all just comes down to humility. Um, obviously, they're, they're paying – us money they entrust us with their kids development you know not only from a relationship standpoint but now a monetary standpoint so they are giving us money uh to hopefully you know progress their kid and make them better there's a lot of really good high school coaches out there there's a lot of not so good high school coaches out there same thing in the instructor world there's a lot of good ones and there's a lot of not so good ones so I think it comes down to humility um, and, you know, teach your kid to be very respectful because that's a tricky situation, you know, where say your, your, your high school coach says, says hit the ball on the ground. Right. And then he goes to an instructor like you guys and they say, Hey, we want a slight upswing. We want to hit line drives. We want to be right over the shortstop second base, you know, drive the ball in the gap. Right. Well, that's not how, the high school coach has molded it. So then that kid gets backlash or, you know, a high school coach may want to throw a lot of breaking balls. Um, and Johnny's breaking ball is not very good. Best, best pitch he's got. The only pitch he's got is a mid eighties fastball. He can put it wherever he wants. Um, so, I mean, having those conversations with not only the instructor, but with the co or the high school coach that just is like, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing. Just as long as you're transparent with that, that high school coach with that instructor, if it's good on both sides, if you got a good high school coach and a good instructor, uh, which I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of my guys who go to very good high school programs and play for really good high school coaches. Um, so there's never been a riff for me. Um, there's been some questions, um, but I think as long as that kid, and I've had a lot of great kids that are very transparent with their high school coach and they want to be up front and the parents do too. You know, the parents, put me in contact with their high school coach say like, Hey, I want you guys to get on the same page. No big deal. Perfect. But there's a lot of, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say there's a lot of kids that do it the wrong way, but there's a lot of kids that obviously they know the value of, of the instructor. They know, you know, they know that that high school program is not doing it the way that their instructor or, or, you know, summer coach or whatever is doing it. So they tend to kind of shield off the high school coach and not listen to him. Be a sponge when you're young. I mean, there's a lot of, even, even if your high school coach is not a good coach, or even if your summer coach is not a good coach, I promise you there's going to be one to two to three to five things that they say that resonate with you. You just have to listen for them and you have to be ready and open-minded. Um, but yeah, it's a tri that's a tricky a tricky situation, but it can be handled with class. Uh, just as long as, like you talked about, Adam, is is we are transparent and we have the communication up front. Um, because if if you try and just walk around it and and avoid it, it only snowballs, uh, and then you have a bigger issue at the end. So, um, yeah, that, I try and I try and tell my kids like be as respectful as you can. Um, do what your, your coach asks you to do but you have to tell them if you don't feel like something's right for you or vice versa with me yep. as well. Yep. Yep. And that's a, that's a really good point. That's something that a lot of people, I guess, don't know about. I've actually had a couple of coaches reach out um, to me recently because um, the kids have been getting better, which is a positive thing, obviously. And they're like, Hey, you know, I'm just kind of interested in what you're doing. I want to be on the same page and use the same verbiage that you're using. Um, cause I see a lot of growth and, and I respect guys, you know, cause it's, it takes a humble guy, but, and, and, and I, I'll say this, it takes a very confident person to say stuff like that too, because they're comfortable with themselves. Um, but I, we have guys that ask that question and obviously you'll run into some guys who are like, you know, F that guy, you know, whatever. And, and it, you'll run into people like that all the time. But if anybody ever approaches me and, and says, Hey, I really like this. I obviously try to go over and above with that. And that's, you know, sometimes the dynamic is negative with certain coaches, but you know, and I mean, we've, we've had conversations like that. I mean, you know, with, with street, the conditioning, especially, um, but you know, uh, Bart, what's kind of, before we close out here, um, what's kind of your biggest advice to pitchers? Um, 
when it comes to, you know, not just the development off season, but mainly in season as well. I obviously we finished another season coaching together um, and you can kind of touch on and kind of wrap up anything else you want to, you want to speak to the public about right here um, about anything else you want, obviously too. But you know, what, what's kind of your advice to guys here moving forward? I mean, biggest advice that I would give to guys is don't pigeonhole yourself. You know, don't, don't walk yourself into a corner thinking that you have to be one way. Right. I, I think we see a lot of kids that, Maybe their parents or, or their teammates' views are, are one way of them, and it's, it's not the way that they, that they prepared. You know, Zach Thompson's a perfect example. Like, you can't pigeonhole a kid. He's got his workload, right? He's got the things that he wants to work on. Do those to the best of your ability, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing, too, is, you know, guys develop at, at different times in their life. Right. Guys are going to show up onto the scene at different times in their life. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say settle, but have a realistic expectation or a realistic goal and achieve that goal and set another one, you know, because mm-hmm. um, we hear it so much from guys that are, we had one this summer. We had a great one this summer. He ended up, uh, you know, signing with a, a division one program, but it was, it, he was the tweener guy right could really pitch uh, bulldog on the mound just kept doing his thing and eventually it turned out well for him Mm -hmm. I tell kids I tell kids all the time it's you will end up where you need to end up there's a million eyes out there and and like Adam touched on earlier if you want to if if you're good enough to play in the big leagues somebody's gonna see you right so keep doing your thing and keep working as hard as you can um you know, and, and every time you take the ball, you know, fight to keep the baseball in your hands. Don't be the guy that, that even if it is the second mound visit, you know, the coach comes out and you know, you're out of the game. Mm-hmm. I still want guys to put up a fight. Like that's that, that rule doesn't mean anything. Like you can't take the ball out of my hand. Like I want that guy. Yeah. You know? Um, and I, I would say too, is, is, you know, kids you get it. If you want to be a good pitcher, throw throw. I don't care. I got ready for spring training in Franklin High School's uh, field house. And I'll say this now because I think the statute of limitations is, is up, but <laughs> I broke in like, and uh, like we would just jimmy a, uh, you know, a screwdriver down in there and pop the door and I'd go in there, flip the lights on, you know, and I got ready for spring training throwing into a, a net. Mm-hmm. I was going to worry about command when I got down to Florida. Like, yeah, I may have stretched out a little bit, like thrown to, you know, cut the, cut the net into quarters, but it's not about the, the flashiness, right? It's not about having the, the best facility to work out in. It's not about having the best scenario. It's about what you do with the scenario that's, that's in your lap, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and take advantage of, of just being able to pick up a baseball. Cause we've all been there. I mean, we've all had somebody tell us like, you can't play for a minute. Like Sean, I, I know that that freshman year at South Alabama was difficult for you mm-hmm. because it was just physically, you couldn't do it. So, and I was there with a the back issue, but it's take advantage of every day that you have to throw and play this game mm-hmm. uh, and play it. Like, you know, they always say like, sing like nobody's listening or whatever that is. I want to, I want to play like everybody's watching. Even if I know there's nobody there, I want to play like I'm at Yankee stadium in front of 60,000 every day because you see kids that, you know, they'll get picked up. They'll get picked up to go play at a, at a college just because of their temperament, mm-hmm. just because of, of their demeanor and their, you know, their work ethic. So um, yeah, I know that was kind of a long winded sort of answer, but take advantage of what you got. I mean, if you want to get better, go get better. Don't just talk about it. Um, it's not easy to play in the big leagues. It's not easy to play in college. There's a lot of front end work that go that goes into that. There's the one percenters out there that, yeah, they, they could get away with not going to an early morning lift. But the 99% of the rest of us that want to play baseball, we have to earn it. Um, mm-hmm. And like we talked about earlier, it's such a skill thing. And you just don't want to be the guy that shows up on the field and didn't practice your skills um, because then you just get out, man. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough game 
and and it's a day in day out blue collar game, and you got to grind, man. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, I'm I'm really glad that you touched on that uh, speci- specifically. Like, you don't need the shiny, ph- phenomenal facility. I mean, you you got a net, you got a ball, you can get better, you know. And that's like I remember the place I grew up in all the way to college, like it, limestone dirt was the hitting facility that I was in. You know what I mean? Like it, it, obviously it's a different, and like everybody's got nice facilities nowadays, but you know, if you're a kid that doesn't have a facility to train at, you know, I beg your parents to get you a net in the garage, do something. Um, I'm really, I'm really glad you touched on that. Cause that's that blue car mentality that I think is, is kind of uh, needs to be instilled on kids constantly. Yeah. And, and- and just the other flip side of that is if you do have the best facility in the world, don't lose fact to the fact that this is work, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Don't think that just because you're there in this great facility that it's just going to open up those doors. You got to, you got to earn it. Mm-hmm. Even if you are that kid. Yep. Adam, anything else you want to close out with? Yeah, that's just two professional pitchers now that mentioned either throwing into a net or Zach Thompson mentioned he threw into a fence during the quarantine stuff. And these are guys at the highest level of baseball willing to go to a park and throw into a net or throw into a cage. So I'm so glad that you were able to hit on that. Bart, man, that was some awesome stuff today. Thank you for coming on with us. And I even learned some stuff today, and I think our listeners are really, really going to enjoy this one. Cool. Well, I appreciate you guys having me on, man. It's been fun. Absolutely, brother. Yeah, man. I mean, we could get on here uh, probably and talk about for another couple hours. So this was a good episode. There's a lot of there's a lot of nuggets here that I think that is are not talked about specifically. And I love I obviously, you know, you know, being a buddy of mine, I love your aspect and hearing your your thoughts on things. Um, so good stuff, brother, man. Um, well, guys that are listening until next time, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please leave that five star review. We'll see you guys later.